Wow, preach it, Kelly. Preach it. <laughs> Woo! That's amazing. Good job. Uh, welcome, guys, to New Hope Calvary Chapel. I'm Pastor David. So glad that you're here. Um, this week, you know, I was, I was talking to a buddy of mine, and it seems like so often I've been talking to more and more people that are just going through difficulty, struggling. And, and, and you know, it's interesting because the calendar year changes on January 1st, but that doesn't always mean that life just radically changes, right? It doesn't mean that 2020 necessarily is over because it's 2021. And I know it's this redundant thing sometimes that we talk about of like, you know, why do we keep bringing this up? Because it's hard, it's difficult, and we're all walking through it together. And so we want to lean into hope. We want to lean into Jesus. We want to lean into uh, what he's called us to do. But we also want to talk about these things. And so I was talking to a buddy of mine and um, many conversations this week, but, but this buddy specifically was talking about how he just isolated himself. Isolated himself. Anyone in 2020 isolate yourself? Have you, did you find yourself isolated? We just felt like you were distant, um, where there was just complete isolation, where you, you just wanted to be alone. Can I mention one thing? Do you mind turning on the lights really quick? Sorry, I can't see the... It's glasses, guys. Glasses. I mean, right? All right. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so just talking about isolation, right? Just the, the struggle and the struggle being real and, and how when chaos hit the fan, you know, people tried to... People kind of brought their families in and went into isolation, but what isolation does is it breaks you off from community. You hear me, church? Isolation breaks you off from community, and then all of a sudden you're left on an island by yourself. Anyone been there this year or past year? Anyone feel that? Where well, you just feel isolated. You're alone. You're by yourself, right? It's, it's hard and difficult to go through life when you feel alone or when you're just in a small, small, small group of people. And so you're isolating yourself. And so as I'm talking to this buddy, it's like, dude, when I, I understand the COVID thing, and, I, and that's not the point, right? I understand we're supposed to do certain things, and we're supposed to social distance and not hang out with families. But there, there's a thing that happens when we isolate ourselves. Fear starts to enter into our life. Destruction starts to enter into our life. We start to think that God is not with us. We start to think that uh, the enemy is winning in our life. We start to think all the lies that the enemy is telling us. Who's been there before? Hearing the lies of the enemy and believing the lies of the enemy. Believing them wholeheartedly that they're actual truth. Like that happens, right? And so as I'm talking, it's like, dude, you, you got to get out of that isolation. You, you have to find community even in the era that we're, we're in right now. We have to find that community. Why? Because as you enter into community with people, other believers, those that, that will encourage you, those that will love you, those that will walk with you, something starts to happen within your heart. You start to grow. You start to understand God's love more. You start to understand why God put us here on this planet. You start to understand what you're called to. But when you isolate yourself, you have no idea what you're called to. Because the enemy starts to speak lies into your life and lies into your ear, and you start to believe the enemy over God. I've felt that many times in my life. Felt that many times in my life where it, the struggle is real. Where you have these times of uh, depression or you have these times of just isolation and, and you go into depression. Anyone willing to be honest this morning and say, I've struggled with depression before? Look around, guys. Look around. Many people. And so the last thing we want is isolation, right? The last thing we want is that. What we need is community. What we need is other believers lifting us up. What we need is those rallying around each other, us rallying around those that are struggling and saying, hey, we're here with you. Let us walk with you. Let us be with you. Let us pick you up if that is what needs to happen. Let us put us on your shoulders if that's what needs to happen. We'll do anything to continue moving forward the gospel, to continue moving forward in our community, to continue bringing forth the gospel to those that don't understand it, to those that don't know Jesus. If you don't mind opening your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, we've been in a series called Focused. And the idea is, what are we focused on? The idea is there's a mission, and that mission is critical. There's a critical, critical, critical mission. And, and for some for some of us, and oftentimes it's we get distracted on what the mission is. We get distracted on what we're supposed to be focused on. It's easy to get distracted, especially in, in our age, especially in what, we're, what we have. These things, who's going to be honest, this is a distraction. 
And you know what's funny is? There's a clock on there that tells you how much time you spend on it. Anyone get that update every week? You know what's funny with mine? Every Sunday morning, when I get to church, I get a screen report that comes to my phone. And honestly, guys, at times, I'm scared to look at it. How much time did I spend on my phone? How much time did I spend on certain apps? How much time was I spending on social network? How much time was I spending on email? How much time was I spending on text? All those things. You know what's so funny is? Calls used to be this high. Now calls are down here. Isn't that interesting? We'd rather text people. And, what's, and I'm going to say it right. I, I do the same thing. I do the same thing. It's like, hey, I'll call you back, or hey, I'll text, you know, and I'm sorry if you've ever got that. <laughs> it's true, though. I will call you back. But it's, it's hard these days, right? And even that's a form of isolation because, right, you're putting yourself over here going, I'd rather text than call. Who's had a call this week that was so encouraging? You called someone, you needed it, and you got encouragement. Amen. Amen. Can I say this as a church? Can we call people more? Can we call people more? Can we have a phone call? Even if it's five minutes, ten minutes, call people more. Because it's so nice to hear you're going to call. <laughs> I'm going to put it on airplane mode real quick. <laughs> I always fear having my phone right here, too, because I always feel like my grandma or someone's going to call me, like right in the middle of this. It's like, mijo. Anyways. <laughs> yes, yeah, never mind. <laughs> I like grandma a lot. Um. But that, that's the point, right? It's like we, we, we kind of shifted as a culture. And I'm bringing this up, guys, because this is the things I deal with on a daily basis. It's like call people more. Because why? There's, there's community that way. We've lost that. We've lost sight of that. And as we're talking about focus and what we're focused on and the mission being critical, right now people need community more than ever before. You with me, church? Do you agree? We need community more than ever before. So let me ask you, what are you focused on? What are you focused on? What's the mission? What's God called you to? Is the mission that you're on, is it the one you're supposed to be on? Is, the one that, is it the one that's critical that God calls you to? Because we, we've, we've heard this probably in church, if you've ever been in church, that literally as you step out of these doors, you enter into the battle, right? Here, the point of me being here as a pastor is to encourage you to then go outside and make disciples. That's the whole point. It isn't to sit in the pew, listen and listen and listen and then do nothing with it. It's that we all learn together. That's why I'm so brutally honest all the time. And I hope you understand that. Why I'm so honest about my own life. Because I struggle too. I struggle with the same things. It's hard. It's difficult. I have a normal job. I have a family. Five kids. It's a lot, right? And I too need community. I too need the phone calls. I, too, need to spend time with friends. I, too, need that community with our church. You hear me? We all need it. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to backtrack before we get to the actual part that I want to focus on. But, but simply put, we're going to be reading just about the gospel. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says this, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What it's talking about here is Christ's death perfecting us and the sanctified. We're the sanctified. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Talk about Jesus. From the time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And here's what's amazing about that verse. When we're dealing with the things that we're dealing with right now, you read that verse and you should be encouraged to say, what, at some point, Jesus, that the enemy is going to be Jesus' footstool. Isn't that amazing? What is that saying? He wins the battle. And not just the battle, he wins the war. And so that's encouraging to read. It's like, Lord, this is so good. This is so good that the enemy will become your footstool. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's us. Once we give our life to Jesus, we're being sanctified. We're being changed. There's things that are taking place. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before. Verse 16. It's going to basically put us back to Jeremiah. This is the covenant that will make with them after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my laws into their hearts. That's called sanctification. The laws are coming in. And their minds, I will write them. He's saying those, those laws, those things that he, that he mentioned to us, the Ten Commandments, the, the, all the promises he's given them. He's writing it on our hearts and our minds. Verse 17. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Who's encouraged by that verse? Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Jesus, for that verse. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 18. Now, where there is remission of these There is no longer an offering for sin. If you remember back in culture, their culture, what would they have to do for sins? They would slaughter lamb. They would slaughter pigeons. I'm so glad we don't have to do that because as a pastor back then, that's nasty. You guys are bringing the sheep, and it's a bloody mess. It's like you have to cut open the sheep. You have to kill the birds. You're like, oh, man. And then that one guy comes in. We'll just call him Frank, whatever. He comes in, and he has like five sheep. You're like, oh, dang, again? Man, you struggled this week, huh, man? Right? But that's all of us. And so we don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because Jesus paid the ultimate price. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And so we no longer have to do these things. I heard this story uh, probably a couple years ago. There was a, a young girl. She actually was a professional snowboarder. She lived in Salt Lake City. She gets saved, and she starts to go to a church up in Salt Lake. And she starts reading from the, from the very beginning, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all these things. And she starts getting through the laws. And one week, she, she has a, a bad week, and she literally comes to church, and she brings doves. I'm not even joking. I'm not joking. And it's amazing because what's happening in her heart. She reads these things. She's like, i got to bring a sacrifice for my sins. Right? Crazy. And so the pastor's like, this, one, this is incredible, but two, no, let me, let me tell you about the New Testament. Let me tell you about Jesus, right? Like, but that was her heart was like, I see this, like, this is real, right? And I'm not even joking, this is about 10 years ago, so modern day. But she thought as she's reading the law, like, I need to do this for my sins. And so he, he takes her, he goes, no, 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 we don't, we don't need to do this, right? And he goes, let's start at Matthew. Let's start with the Gospels, I'll teach you the, the, the Old Testament. We'll walk through that. You're, you're amazing. But let's start at Matthew. Let's learn about Jesus. Let's learn about he was the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. You no longer have to do this. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I was hearing the story going like, whoa. <laughs> that would be crazy to see, right? But so, so, so amazing. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Jesus paid that price. All right, our text here in 19. So we understand here. That Jesus died for our sins. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Now it's saying to hold on to this. In 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Some of these words sometimes are crazy to read. It's like blood. Yes, he died for our sins. He bled for our sins, right? By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So he opened up this door that we've never seen before. So what it's saying, when he died for our sins by his blood. Now our sins are wiped away. Now the veil has been torn. That means we we have an opportunity now to have a relationship with Jesus. There's no more barrier anymore. It's just him and us. And as it continues on, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's it saying? Love God. Allow him to penetrate your heart. He'll wipe away those sins. And as evil comes in, he'll begin to remove those things from your life. It's called being sanctified. That's the idea here. That we are changed people. That God makes us new. That he removes those sins that come up. Maybe sins that come from 10 years ago pop up this last week. Right? He'll continue to wipe those things away and helping you through it. Because he knows we're sinners. And we need his grace. And we need his mercy. And we need his love. And so as it continues on, verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What's amazing about this particular verse is the whole context here is saying, okay, love God and love who? People. People. So here's this. 
Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. What's the confession? It's us realizing we need Jesus and we're going to hold on to that hope because he's the only hope that we need. He's the only hope that we can have without wavering. What's encouraging about that is we can hold on to that hope, still be way over here at times in our life, Yes, we might feel like we're wavering, and at times that's where it feels, right? We're on a big boat, right? 2020 was a giant boat, and the whole time it's flipping. It's upside down. It's like a canoe. We're like, where are we going? And then you're like, all right, we're on a straight pathway that out of nowhere. It's like, whoa, and you go right. And then you go left. It was crazy, right? But the whole time we can hold on to that hope, even though it's crazy, without wavering, without leaving that faith, without leaving Jesus, without walking away. For he who promised is faithful. What does this mean? That as you hold on to that hope, that Jesus too is holding on to you. And what it's saying is, as you go about your life, as you go through difficult times, as whatever you find yourself in, whatever year you find yourself in, the promises he's promised to you, he will keep. He says, the promises, for he who promised is faithful. Who has seen Jesus faithful in their life? That's our hope. That's what we get to hold on to. And then it goes on and says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So verse 23 is perfectly stating we hold on to our hope, which is Jesus. We love Jesus for what he's done, the promises he's given us. He'll stay faithful to the very end. What does he say? He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise we get to hold on to, and he's faithful. And then it goes on, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Love God and love people. This is all over the Bible. All over the Bible. The first two greatest commandments over and over and over and over again. Then it goes into a little more detail. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in a matter of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Do we see the day approaching? What's funny is Paul and all all these apostles that that are a part of this, they're going, man, the day's near, right? And And Jesus barely left. They're like, the day's near. Get ready. Right? And we're 2,000 years later. We're like, get ready. Right, But you start to see the shift that's taking place in our culture. You start to see the shift that's taking place in our lives. And so what does it mean? It doesn't mean to fear. It means to cling to that hope without wavering. It means to lean into the promises that God has given us. It means to be on mission and stay focused because guess what? It's critical. If we know Jesus is coming, then every day of our lives we realize every breath we take is critical because we don't know when our last day is here. We have no idea. No idea. So my hope is that every day that God gives me on this earth, that I would love my wife, I would love my kids, and I would love my community like no one else. The first part of verse 25 is huge. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. What does that mean? Community. Gathering together. Being with each other. That's huge. How are we supposed to consider one another, stir up love for one another, and do good works for one another if we're not together? If we're not in community? If we're not reaching out to the community? If we're not doing something for the community? I know what it's like out there right now. I'll tell you, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking how many people aren't going to a church anymore. It's heartbreaking of how many people are just leaving. Just staying home, watching online. Guess what? I know it's convenient. Trust me, we did it for three months. I'm like, this is a nice break. But after three months, I'm like, this is not a nice break. I want to see people. I want to be with my community. I want to be with other believers. I want to be with my friends. 
So this verse is speaking clear to that, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. I understand what we're dealing with, so I'm not saying we're just going to do whatever we want, those things. Obviously, we're trying to, to do exactly what the school's asking us to do and our community's asking us to do. But the point is we need to gather together in a community, and we can do that safely. And then it continue, continues on, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as we know the day is approaching. What is it saying? Encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. But we can't do that unless we're talking. We can't do that unless we're in community with each other. We can't do that unless we're actually together. So it's so big that we as a church family do this. So when I'm asking you, call someone. Don't just say, oh, I will. Do it. Do it. You know how amazing it is to get on the phone and actually be on the phone with somebody and be able to encourage them and they encourage you? You smile afterwards. It's like, man, that was a joyous conversation. And what did we talk about last week? Not leaving a bad taste in people's mouths, right? That we're called to be good fruit, bear that good fruit, that as we have conversations with people, maybe the opposite of what we even believe, but that we leave a good taste as they walk away. That's Jesus. Because never do you see Jesus ever leave a bad taste in someone's mouth. Even when they were shocked at the stuff he was saying. Even when he rebelled against the Pharisees and those that were religious at the time. Yeah, they hated him. He was creating a movement. He was changing the world. He was showing people who he is and what he's about to do. Die for our sins and sanctify us. Yeah, those that had an agenda, I'd be mad too. Because they saw what he was doing. And it's going to be the same way here. As you become sanctified, as God changes your life, as things start to take place in your heart, yeah, there will be people that go, what is up with him? But it's not, I'm better than you. It's, I found hope. And let me show you who he is. That's what it is. And that's how you build larger communities. And that's how you pour into those people around you. That's how you're going to grow in your faith. That's how people are going to come to find the saving grace that's found in Jesus. So again, this, these, these six verses here instruct us that the body of believers is to live and function in this world through encouragement, through mutual admonition, just, encur- just encouraging one another, being there for each other, and meeting together frequently. When you look at the old church, what did they do? It wasn't probably big buildings like this. They were meeting in homes, right? But they were meeting together in community. They were going out and they were doing stuff for those around them, for their neighbors. They were loving on the people that God put them around. That's you. Because guess what? Every single day you have an opportunity to bless someone's life. I, I read a book recently and just got done with it. It was called Dangerous Prayers. And honestly, it's one of the craziest things that, as I got done with this book because the whole book calls for us to pray dangerously. And he goes through specific things that David said, which David said a lot of stuff. You ever read the Psalms? I mean, it's like a roller coaster in his life. He's like, they're all after me. I'm going to die. You're my hope. Everything's blowing up, but I love you, Jesus. Literally, it was crazy. If you read the Psalms and you hear David's heart, it was a roller coaster at times. Roller coaster. But there's something very, very unique about it. He always pointed to Jesus. Always. We are called to be together. We are called to meet together. We are called to encourage one another. And what's interesting about this text is the original hearers that were hearing this were still struggling to to set up what church looked like and to understand what took place when they gathered together. And guess what? It's kind of the same today. You know, we we have this structure and all these things. But let me tell you this. This is just the time that we get to encourage, right, and and, and be together as a family like we're talking about here. But it doesn't stop here. That's the problem today is it stops here. When we leave this building, what should we do? Build community up. What should we do? Meet with other people. What should we do? Be with other believers and encourage one another. This is just one day of the week. Now I'm saying every night you have to pack your week up, but what I'm saying is get together with friends. 
get together with other believers, be in community with one another. That's how we're going to build the church. Amen, man. Amen. That's how we're going to build the church. But it takes one of us to step out in faith to get it going. It takes one of us picking up the phone and making the phone call. It takes one of us reaching out to maybe a friend you haven't talked to in a while and say, hey, man, you mind coming over? Or let's go get some coffee. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. And you'll start to see God move in a huge way. Kelly mentioned something that we're doing again on Thursday nights. We talk about it often. But I'll tell you guys, it, on Thursday nights, we have been, the Lord has been building just an amazing and strong community through that. Because we get to see the same people almost on a regular basis. And it's interesting as we learn about their lives and learn about the things they're going through. And honestly, uh, guys, it is so amazing when you have someone like Jamie you know, hosting and walking people through and, and putting food in boxes and those things. And by the time they come around the warehouse and, the, and, and they're towards the end, just sobbing. Just sobbing. You know, the person that Jamie's with or, or any of Kelly, any, anyone that walks people through, I'm telling you, by the end, it's like people are just crying. Why? Because they see that we have hope. And as we pour into our local communities, that's what we're pouring in. We're pouring in hope, that there's hope here. And guess what? You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Manny, do you mind coming up here really quick? Sorry to throw you off, man. <laughs> <laughs> what's interesting is, you know, when I, we've talked about this as a team, but what's so interesting about communities, I feel like it looks like this at times. Do you mind just standing over there? And then, uh, Jamie, do you mind just kind of standing in the middle there? We're going to do this social distance style. Right there, Clay, can't, you can't get away yet. Go, uh, just stand right there, that's great. Um, Daniel, just stand over there on the other side. Thank you. Tom, can I bug you? Stand over there. Just stand kind of right next to your seat. Yeah, right there. Roger, do you mind standing up? Aaron, do you mind just coming right here? Here's what's interesting. This is community, right? Just, just, be, with, just be with me for a second, right? We have all of these people. We're standing in a circle, if, or, or a U is what I like to call it, right? And, and if we were not social distance, we would be closer. But the point is, like, we're together, right? And when, when someone's going through something, what is the other person going to do? Reach out to them. Reach out to them. Hey, how can I help you? What do you need? You know, how can I bless you? What is your family need? How can I pray for you? Right? All these things. But what's interesting is it's not a circle. It's actually a you. Why? Because we're leaving this space open for more people to join. Does that make sense? And what's interesting is I wish I had a longer rope here. But the point is sometimes in community, you, you have this space, right, and, and one person inside of that community seems to go this direction, right? And they're way over here in the corner. And, and, and you notice that they haven't been around for a while. But the point of this is community, right? This represents the community. And what does Manny start to do? Come back. Come back to the community. Come back and be with us. We love you. Yeah, hey, maybe you've been gone for a second. It's okay. You don't have to feel guilty because you didn't come on a Sunday. Can I be so honest, church? You don't have to feel guilty because you didn't show up for one Sunday. It's okay. We love you. We're here for you. You can still make a phone call. It's okay. Truly. Don't let the enemy rob you from the community you're supposed to be a part of. Don't let the enemy rob you from what Jesus wants to speak into your life. Yes, I understand. We get busy. We got hunters in the room. Josh knows. We got hunters, right? We got people that during the summer, I get it. Trust me. I want a Sunday off too. I want to go hang out on the beach. Hang on the lake. I want to do all those things too. I get it. I'm not telling you and trying to convict you. You better be here every Sunday. That's it. It's the only way you're being saved. No way. No way. I'm just saying, be in community. Make the phone call. Be together. Let's do this together because I'll tell you right now, does anyone want to do life alone? No. Raise your hand if you want to do life alone. Look around. Very simple. You want to do life together in community. You guys can sit down. Thank you. 
Yes, give them a round of applause. We want to do this together. Do not allow the enemy to tell you that just because you did not show up, that you're out of community and no one cares for you. Because I'll tell you, I know people that miss one Sunday, they come back, and I'm so sorry for missing Sunday. You don't have to apologize to me. You do not have to apologize to me. Are you good? I'm good. Perfect. Let's move on. Glad you're here. Glad you're back. And right now, it's like, if you're sick, stay home. Please stay home. <laughs> but the point is, you're part of the community. So what does the church do? What do we do? What's our part? The church should nurture those who are, are new to the faith or maybe they're not super strong in the faith. That's called community, right? Those that give their life over to Jesus uh, recently, what do we do? We encourage them. We walk with them. We bring them by our side and we go, let me show you more about Jesus. Let me show you more and more about Jesus. In Romans 14:1, it says this, Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Wait, what? I'm going to read it again. Accept other believers who are weak in faith. It means those that are just coming into the faith. Those are ones that are, you know, they're, they're asking questions. They're trying to figure it out. It says don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. That's huge. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer is sensitive uh, and will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Ooh. Who are we to do that? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. You know what's interesting about that? Whose approval are we trying to get? Are we trying to get the approvals of others by showing up every Sunday and, and marking it on a calendar? I've been every Sunday, 365. Do we, do we show up to things just so we can mark it off and say, I've, I was there. David saw me there. You don't need my approval. You need Jesus's. And guess what? He gave it to you when he died on the cross for your sins. He said, you're my child. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. I care for you. Let me change you. What else? We're supposed to give support and accountability to, to one another. This is our duty. It's our duty as a community, as a church, that we would support one another, that we'd be accountable to one another. I, I, I was talking to a friend just this weekend, and he's talking about all these, I'll be so honest with you guys, all these pastors that are falling one right after the other, having affairs, different things, uh, people that we looked up to, people that I looked up to. Just falling one after another. You know what I say every single time I see it? Accountability. Accountability. Nobody's keeping them accountable. And all of a sudden, people hit a certain stature. It's like this term, celebrity pastor. And all of a sudden, people think, God's hand must be all over them if they're this big. You know, my goal isn't to become Justin Bieber. It's not my goal. My goal is to change the local community of Lehigh. That's the goal. My goal is to love my wife and my kids and be a provider. Bring home a paycheck to pay our bills. Keep it simple. Be content with what God has given us. That's it. But continue to pour into our local community and then from there hope to change the world. Because God called us here. And we're going to start here and we'll finish here. But we have to give others support. We have to be accountable to one another. And lastly, I'll leave you with this. As a community and continue to build, we must consider it a privilege to pray for one another. Because as we're all going through something, prayer is so powerful. So powerful. What's amazing about 
New Hope is we have a prayer team that literally anytime something happens in anyone's life that's a part of our community, it gets sent immediately to our prayer team. And guess what? They actually pray for you. They actually pray for you. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because they know that it's powerful. Because they want to intercede on your behalf. Because they know that God's going to move in that prayer. So my hope is as we build community, that we wouldn't allow the enemy once again to to, to speak lies into our life when we don't show up to something. That we wouldn't allow the enemy to isolate ourselves and we'd be all alone. That we'd step into that community that you just saw. That we'd be together. That we realize we need to keep each other accountable. We need to encourage one another. We need to love those around us. And we need to keep it, not a circle, but a you, yeah. so we can invite others in. It isn't about new hope and the, and the click of new hope. It's about those that desperately need Jesus. And guess what? We all do. All of us. Go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I don't know where you're at in your life, in your relationship with Jesus, or even if you have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know, but I want to give you an opportunity this morning to step into a faith, to step into a relationship with Jesus. As we talked about, he died for your sins. He wants to sanctify you. All it means is change you, change your life. Turn your your heart that might be hard and make it soft, and he will start to change you, and you'll start to see just the incredible things that he wants to do in your life. Or maybe you come from a different background. You're like, I've heard all these things, David. I've heard them all. Well, let me tell you this. Have you heard truly about Jesus and him alone? He's the one that changes you. He's the one that wants that relationship. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to to step into that faith, to step into that relationship with him. And all I'm going to ask you is just raise your hand, and we're going to say a simple prayer together. That's it. The Bible makes it so clear. Just believing upon what Jesus did for your sins on that cross, dying for you, resurrecting three days later, defeating sin and death for you. It's amazing. If that's you, you want to know Jesus, come on raising your hand this morning. I just want to pray with you. been isolating yourself you know you've been distant you you know the enemy's just been speaking lies you can't go there you shouldn't show up you haven't been maybe that's you this morning and, and you just want prayer to step back into that community and have the strength to do so because I know at times when the enemy has a grip on us it is hard to get away If that's you, do you mind raising your hand? I just want to pray for you. Pray for you. If you're struggling with community, struggling with people. Amen, I see your hand. Father, I ask right now that you would break that barrier, that you break those chains, Lord, that the enemy has on on those raising their hands. Father, you, you show them we love them, Lord. You love them. You care for them. You want them here, Lord. And it's okay to have those times, Lord, but, Lord, you don't want them to isolate. You want them to step into community. You want to step into relationship with other people, Lord. You want them to be encouraged. And you want to use this to encourage them, Lord. So I'm asking right now, encourage them. Show them. The enemy doesn't need to have the stronghold on them. They can step into that community. They can step closer to you, closer to friends, closer to family, closer to those within this church. Lord, there's no judgment here, Father. And we truly love them. We want them to grow. 
We want them to be here, Lord, in community with other believers who, who want to just encourage them. Father, for the rest of us, I just ask, Lord, that you would truly, truly show us what community looks like, Lord. That that would be our focus, Lord. That, that we'd be on mission for what you have. And realize, Lord, that it just doesn't end with Sunday mornings. That, Lord, it, it continues on throughout the week. That as we step out of this place, that as we step out of this building, Father, that that's where it begins. It begins there. And it's so important, Lord, to, to step into what you have in our life. That is so important to lean on you. It's so important, Lord, to, to give all of our worries, our cares over to you. So we can properly, Lord, do what you have called us to do. That is love you and love people. So, Father, we... We give you this Sunday, Lord. We give you this week, Father. We give you our whole entire lives, Lord. And we ask that you would use us in incredible ways, Lord. That you would use us to, to make a giant change in this community, Lord. That, Lord, we would be faithful to what you've given us, to what you've done, Lord, and what you're going you're gonna to continue to do. Because we know it's not over, Lord. The best is yet to come. Be with us, Father, as we end in worship with you. In Jesus' name we say, amen.